need to turn on the, turn the microphones. <coughs> I'll do that. Oh. So what I'd like to do is call the meeting to order then here at 9.05. I think that uh, it's great that everybody was able to make it on, uh, on a sort of a snowy, sunny day. And just as an opening, I'd like to quickly say that uh, I'm really privileged and honored to be sitting on this side here. And uh, I've got a lot of background information and sage advice from Joe. And she's the one that showed me how to handle this thing. So, <laughs> she's such a good woman. I love her. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and I'd just like to personally thank uh, Joe for her advice and her support and her wisdom in, in making sure there's a good transition. She's done a wonderful job here. Uh, and uh, the other note would be to say I'm looking forward to working with each and every one of you. I think that we're all here because we really care about seniors. And I'm just looking forward to uh, good working relationships and, uh, and, and making things better for seniors across the three service counties that we, we uh, focus on. Um, so with that, I'd like to move to the uh, agenda. I think you've all got a copy of that came out email, and then we have a hard copy here this morning. If there are any changes to the agenda. I think so. it's by the front door. Do you want to look at mine? Yeah. Okay. You know, let me just look at one. Okay. If not, can I, in, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So move. Or second. agenda, I'm sorry, the agenda. Move and second it. Yes. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, carried. Uh, and then, pardon? Now, I thought you were saying my name. No, no. It's not the first carried. time that's happened. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying so close, too. Got it. Motion carried, right. Got it. And then now if you take a look at the minutes as well. And that's for the December meeting. Oh, in here. That one we did. December 8th. Yes. Comments or changes to the minutes? New members, um, you may or may not have had a chance to really look through that, but uh, something to take back with you. I'll entertain a motion to uh, on the minutes. Yes. Okay, move. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Perfect. I just realized that I didn't do an introduction, which was sort of a common thing that we've done in the past, especially for the members in the audience. Uh, so what I would like to do is just uh, have everybody give a quick, <laughs> quick introduction and in who you are and what area you represent. Carrie Schillinger, the Area Agency on Aging of PPACG. Margaret Hunter, the Myron Stratton Home, Colorado Springs. Carolyn Massey, Colorado Springs. Phyllis Huggins, Eastern El Paso County. Cheryl Schnell, Department of Human Services. Fran St. Germain, El Paso County. Barb Cottle, Alzheimer's Association, and our, our office at least serves El Paso, Teller, and Park Counties. Norma Garbani, Western El Paso County and the AA Area Agency on Aging. <laughs> Cynthia Aki, uh, Colorado Springs. Nancy Stannard, Teller County. Carol Parks, Teller County. Joe Ruth. Colorado Springs. Jerry Novak, Colorado Springs. All right. Lisa Aldridge, Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, Area Agent County. Ralph Bauer, Teller Senior Coalition. Pat Ellis, Overkey. Michelle Vaca, Senior Mobile Dental. Matt Memorial, Aspen Point. All right, thank you very much. So, now we're into agenda item number three, public comments. Are there things that people would like to bring up that are not on the agenda at this point from the public side. If not, I think we can move then to the for uh, mental health first aid seniors that presentation. And this would be Madeline Arroyo from Good Aspen morning. Point. Good morning. <laughs> All right. So I get to show my technical prowess. All righty. Ta da. <laughs> <laughs> so good morning and thank you all for giving me the time to talk about a program that is very near and dear to my heart. I'm, uh, I work with Aspen Point and I am a coordinator for Mental Health First Aid and I am also an instructor for Mental Health First Aid. 
uh, we are certified. Um, I'm pretty excited. This past year we trained, we had 56 um, trainings over this year and we trained over 1,300 individuals in mental health first aid and they were certified as mental health first aiders. Um, this has been our biggest year so far. Um, whenever we bring this program into the community, um, it gives us the opportunity to uh, touch a lot of different segments. We have been able to reach out into the city employees, to educators, to law enforcement, nursing students, churches, military institutions, and even the district attorney's office. And each time we reach into all of these different segments of our community, it fosters a common language and the understanding of mental illness. It helps to break down the myths and our fears of the unknown. It helps dispel the misinformation that we've received in the past from movies and our media and that they have presented to us over time. And most importantly, it helps to break down the stigma of mental illness. And so here's a quick outline of what we'll be covering this morning. Um, sorry for all the ums. I just became really aware of them. <laughs> we'll start with a brief overview of mental health information, move into how this relates to our aging population, and finally, as leaders, how you can support those on the front lines to recognize the signs and symptoms of mental health problems. One in five individuals will experience a mental health problem in their lifetime. A mental health problem is a broad term, and it's used to include those living with a diagnosis or living with the cluster of symptoms that are not strong enough to be diagnosed as, a, as an illness. Say, mild depression, for instance, where people can kind of work their way through every day, but yet it's not quite diagnosable. It's not at that level, but it impacts their lives. And so there are a lot of people that are living day to day like this. A mental disorder is a diagnosable illness, and that is when it reaches the level where it impacts an person's ability to live, laugh, love, and learn. And so that's the extreme. <clears throat> According to the National Institute of Mental Health and the World Health Organization, neuropsychiatric or mental health disorders is the leading disease in the United States. It is more common than heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. Say that again. So neuropsychiatric or mental health disorders is the leading disease in the United States. It is more common than heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. Yeah. A national survey of Americans found that in any given year, 18% will experience an anxiety disorder, 6.8% a major depressive disorder, and 8% a substance use disorder. So it's rather prevalent. So yet only 41% of people with a mental illness will seek treatment or use mental health services in any given year. Less than half will seek help. For those finally reaching out to get the help, the median delay in seeking treatment is over 10 years. The stigma around mental illness is so great that we prefer to live and suffer in silence rather than to talk about our mental health concerns. Across a person's lifetime, there's a 50-50 chance of having a mental illness at some point. It may be mild, it may be moderate, it may be severe. And yet, we don't talk about it. And we don't talk about it because we fear the repercussions in the workplace, in our community, and worse still, the shame that comes with the stigma of a mental, you know, th that's the stigma that's placed upon those with a mental illness. How do we break down the stigma of mental illness and make it okay to talk about it? How do we make it okay to get the help that we need? Or to even ask the questions that might lead us to the road in recovery? Now add to this the stigma of aging. Think about this. Most, of the old, most older adults have grown up in a time and culture that discourage personal disclosure and the sharings of feelings or problems. Many are encouraged, right, to pull yourself up by your bootstraps when you're feeling low. Mental illness was particularly stigmatized in many years ago, and older adults may feel an elevated level of shame, guilt, and embarrassment about a, comprised, a compromised mental state. In 2014, there were 46 million adults aged 65 and older. By 2030, this number is expected to reach 74 million, according to the National Council on Behavioral Health. The 85-plus population, or what is termed the old, old, is projected to triple from 6.2 million in 2014 to 14.6 million in 2040. 
with depression being the most prevalent mental health problem among older adults. A recent study found that 27% of older adults assessed by aging service providers met the criteria for major depression, which at that point is a di um, it's diagnosable. Uh, we know that any level of depression in later life can reduce functional ability and cognition. There are many reasons for these increases in depressive systems, uh, symptoms. Perhaps the loss of friends, maybe, loved ones, social isolation, maybe the chronic pain. There are multiple reasons. But the fact remains, in 80% of the cases, depression is treatable, particularly if we can recognize the symptoms early on. And while a great majority of older adults do not experience mental health concerns <coughs> or disorders, those who do are often unidentified and untreated. And that's where the biggest sadness comes in, is that we're not able to identify it often enough to be able to provide that support and encouragement. So, um, there is, this is where mental health first aid steps in, and this is where mental health first aid can be a valuable component in anyone's life. It is a program that is, well, anyway. <laughs> so I'll show you what mental health is about. I won't read this. I'll give you a moment to read through this yourselves. So mental health first aid is not a substitute for counseling or medical care, peer support, or other professional treatment. Blessings. The program was developed. <laughs> the program was developed in Australia in 2001. It was adapted and managed in the U.S. by the U.S. Nas by the National Council for Behavioral Health, the Maryland Department of Mental Hygiene, and the Missouri Department of Mental Health. More than 740,000 people across the United States have been trained since it was introduced in 2008 in the United States. Mental Health First Aid is an interactive eight-hour course and can be conducted as a one-day seminar or broken into two four-hour sessions. The program was created with the layperson in mind, making it available to anyone that is interested. All Mental Health First Aid instructors must attend a five-day training and be certified by a team of national trainers to ensure that the program is presented to fidelity. Mental Health First Aid is not therapy, nor does it teach you to be a therapist. So what do participants learn when they attend Mental Health First Aid training? We present risk factors, signs and symptoms, and information on a number of mental health disorders. We delve into the physical, behavioral, and the psychological changes a person may be experiencing related to disorders such as depression, anxiety, substance use, psychosis, dementia, delirium, and even suicide in older adults. We teach participants to ask the tough questions when we're meeting or dealing with someone that we fear may be, or not fear, but are concerned they may be struggling with ideas of suicide. <clears throat> um, it's not uncommon. We know that particularly adults and males over the age of 85 have a 4% greater rate of suicide and completing a suicide than the general population. So we do need to be mindful of that. Um, all right. We also provide a five-step action plan with an opportunity to practice how it might work in real life. And this five-step action plan is called ALGE. And it's an acronym for the steps, but it's also kind of a, a touch back to its origination in Australia. So that's our little mascot. He's a little koala bear. I should have brought him today so you could have seen him. He's very uh -huh. cute. <laughs> These are the different modules that we offer. This is a sample of some of them. And they have all been created with different <coughs> populations in mind. And as you can see, the very first one on the left is the older adult module. Aspen Point offers a, or sponsors and offers a monthly adult mental health first aid training free and open to all community members. It is the standard adult module. And these, what they do is they intersperse information that is specific and critical to the well-being of the different groups. And so we can see this the older adult. We have for higher education, for the military, for law enforcement, we provide a youth mental health first aid program as well, the adult standard, and we also are able to offer this in Spanish. And in our community, we have actually held a bilingual uh, Spanish class, which we're 
pretty excited about because not everybody's had an opportunity to do that. The older adult module. So this has got a ton of text, and I'm just going to go ahead and kind of read through it real quick. Uh, the older adult module introduces participants to the unique risk factors and warning signs of mental health problems in older adults. It builds understanding of the importance of early intervention. It teaches individuals how to help someone in crisis or experiencing a mental health challenge. And the older adult module is designed for people who regularly interact with older adults, such as direct care workers, nursing assistants, home care workers, volunteers, paraprofessionals, whoever may have a day-to-day -day or ongoing contact with the older adult population. Mental health first aid is evidence-based. We are certified and <clears throat> mental health first aid help increase knowledge and understanding of mental health disorders. It encourages people helping people. It empowers them because they have knowledge. They know what to look for. It supports people getting help. It decreases the social stigma which is part of one of our greatest challenges in opening up conversation and making it a safe topic to talk about. And it increases mental wellness, which is ultimately what we all wish for. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I have some cards here, and if you wouldn't mind passing them around, I'd appreciate that. Any questions? <coughs> of course. I'll start with a question. Sure. Uh, the older adult module, how long uh -huh. is that training? It is the is same. Orientation or is it no, it is actually eight hours. Eight hours. All eight. mental health trainings are eight hours. And as I said, it can be a one-day seminar or it can be broken into two four-hour segments. We try and keep them within the same week and preferably in con on consecutive days we found to be most effective. But they can be separated up to a week. Yes. On your depression, uh, that uh, I noticed with the older ones is mm -hmm. after the spouse has passed. Oh, of course. Of course. Is, is the biggest one, but the, mm -hmm. to get them to admit it yeah. is... It is very challenging, and I think that is part of the, the struggle that older adults face is not only just their spouses, but around them. You know, people that they've had long-standing relationships begin to die, and so they find themselves being that long-standing individual, and that certainly impacts someone's life greatly. And so what to do, right? How do you guide them? And it's just being aware and maybe knowing how to talk with someone. So these are some of the things that we talk about in a mental health first aid training. We practice. You know, I said we have a, an action plan, and that's part of what we practice in the training is if someone is depressed, how might you address them? What are some of the things that you can say to be supportive and to provide encouragement. How do you identify uh, a certified person who has taken this course, and uh, how do you know who they are? How do you mean, as far as a participant taking it, receiving a training, or a certified instructor? Uh, the, the train, <gasps> the trainee. When you when you take this course, mm -hmm. do you give them a certificate. Do you give them a a uh, designated um, initials after their name? <laughs> no, it's not quite that level, but we do provide a certificate. And um, you must complete the full eight hours. It's not like you can attend the morning and leave for the afternoon and still expect to get a certificate. No, that is not an option. Okay. You must attend the entire eight hours. So if, if someone was able, like myself, to mm -hmm. reach out, how do I know who to contact and if this person is has gone through the training? Well, hopefully they have their certificate, and they can show you that as proof. And it has, uh, no, there is not a national roster of participants that have attended a training. There is not that. I mean, we've had 1,300 people in the community, right, um, a minimum. And so we don't keep track of that. But everyone is given that certificate. And so if asked, certainly they should be able to present it to you. And it has an expiration date. It only lasts for three years. And after that, you would need to renew to be able to maintain that certification that you have attended the training and that you understand and you're up to date. Yes, sir. Are there any prerequisites? No. For people? Okay. Just an intense desire <coughs> to be there. <laughs> What is the professional kind of folks, the professional therapists and psychiatrists and psychologists, what is their view on this? Do they accept this or are there some, not jealousies, but you know what I mean? Oh, no. 
Uh, no, uh, if anything, it's, what it is is it's compatible. I mean, you're certainly not training people to become therapists. What we are doing is providing information that can help the layperson know how to ask some questions or to be able to speak with someone and address some of their concerns. And so that is how it is, you know, there is many times we've had clinicians and, um, you know, in different capacities come in and take our classes. And for them, it's very rudimentary. So could these folks be used as, in effect, kind of triage patients? The idea is to be able to, once, ta once having taken the training, to be able to identify some signs and symptoms and then encourage that person to seek the appropriate professional help. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're very welcome, sir. Yes. So if an organization was interested in reaching out to um, participate in a class, mm -hmm. would they contact you directly or is there another? You connection? can contact me and if you want to jot down the um, website address, which is www. It's Mental Health First Aid, M-H-F-A, and then C-O for Colorado. Okay. So .org. If you go there, you can see a listing of all the trainings. Now, what you will find is most of the trainings that are listed on the website are primarily adult and youth. At this point, we don't have a large enough demand for older adults to be for older adult module, so we're not offering that on an ongoing basis. But we are happy to, you know, coordinate something to provide a training for individuals. Yes. Do you have any ongoing support for first aid? Uh, people who have taken the class and then have questions, how do, what is that support system? The, the easiest thing would be each instructor is at liberty to provide their own personal information or provide my information. And so at any point in time, if someone has a question or a concern or they're unclear about something and just want to check on something, certainly they can contact me. It's not a problem. So there's, there's not any formal um, an update or any support system because it mm -hmm. can be very intensive. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. And so what there is available, if one is interested, there is always the National Council on Behavioral Health and their website or mental health first aid, period. It's a national site. And there are webinars which help review things. There is information. There are upgoing, ongoing and updated articles and information. There's a wealth of information that one can reach out to to provide additional information. And that is encouraged and presented in the class. Always. And each in, as part of the class, each individual is provided with a manual that has not only detailed information but a huge list of resources and within that. Sources. Uh, referrals, that is also provided at a community level and that's a handout that we provide. Because that's often the, the, the breaking point. The person is ready right. once, but they can't jump over the ten barriers Ex to, getting, to getting mental health care. I agree. Professional mental health care. It is. It is that. And that is a role that a mental health first aider can assist in, is, well, what, it, what would that professional health look like? Or I know. Not what it would look like. How do you get to Or it? how do you even find it? Where is it? Who do we contact? How do you get to it? Mm -hmm. The value is there, but how many barriers do there? Well, and, and some of that is, is difficult, you know, in and of itself, the way our system is designed because there's transportation concerns. I mean, the actual physical mobility of it. But just finding someone, the list, how long do we have to wait, this person is in distress. But we also have, on a local level, you know, our crisis stabilization unit, which is open 24-7. And so that is something that is open to any and all individuals, regardless of insurance, regardless of your, you know, your ability to pay. It is there for everyone to take advantage of and use. Is that at Aspen Point? It is. It's on Parkside Drive. It is part of Aspen Point. Any other questions or comments? Hi, Thank you. Yes, hello. Um, what is the cost? Oh, the cost. Well, um, ah, yes, a minor thing. <laughs> Typically, our classes, um, we try to start them out with a, um, actually, we prefer that our groups be no smaller than 15 because that's what impacts the ability, you know, as they're creating. It's an interactive course, and so we need to have at least 15 people in a class to be able to keep it going. Our maximum is 35, and again, that's so that we can really give everyone an opportunity to participate in the activities and get something out of it. As far as a cost goes, the average cost is $40 per person for the training. There are, at times, there are grants, there are subsidies, you know, they come and they go, and so whenever they are there, we certainly do everything that we can to be able to cover as much of the cost as possible. 
but the manuals themselves are twenty dollars and so really we're covering the cost of just the papers not even you know the people that teach the trainings for the most part are volunteers we are not paid we are volunteers we do it because we believe in it we know that it works and we're passionate about it and so that's what we bring as instructors to the table does the eight hours um, is that a certifiable continuing education for that? That is a difficult one, and that is something that some institutions have been able to do. It. We go into a lot of schools, and they have worked it out with their HR departments where they can receive CEUs, but it is not something that we provide when we, teach, when we provide the trainings. So whatever organization is organizing the class has the ability to go ahead and do that, but we cannot provide that, just the material and documentation you might need to support it. Well, I'd like, on behalf of the group, I'd like to thank you for the presentation. I think You're very I, you welcome. Know, I took three quick notes, and I was just amazed at the information. Less than half of the adults are seek help. Forty percent. So one disease mm -hmm. and depression is most common in elderly. I think the last one you probably might have known right. that one, but the other two were really kind of eye-opening for me. Mm -hmm. And and I would just you know, thank you for your presentation. I encourage you to continue the outreach and the uh, education and awareness for the community because I think even those facts coming mm -hmm. out, I think those are the things that really can make a difference across the individual communities that we all live in. Somehow the information needs to get out and having the trainings and having people mm -hmm. go out word of mouth, that's, that's, yes. that's good, but there has to be almost another level of uh, ongoing outreach, publicity, marketing, whatever it is, personalizing mm -hmm. the stories so that people really can say, Dang, I didn't realize that I really should be concerned about my neighbor or about this group or about whatever it may be. But again, thank you very much for this presentation. You're very welcome. My and pleasure. That's a perfect segue to <laughs> let you all know that Madeline and I have been working to schedule two full days of mental health first aid for seniors in March. So I will get you details when we have that all confirmed. Pretty excited. But we're looking at doing two, one, uh, so as Madeline was saying, either one full day of eight hours or two half days of four hours, we're going to do two full eight-hour days so that our entire staff can be trained and we can keep the office open, which means we have lots of space for community members to join in. So I will be sure to distribute that information to you once I have the details. Thank, Thank you. you. That's really Excellent. Thank yeah. you. We're pretty excited. Thank you. Welcome to some of our late arriving uh, public yes. members. Well, and, 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 kind of and uh, Joyce Whittle like is out. next to you. And, 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 and Joyce, yep. Please. And Wendy has also arrived. Wendy's here too. Hey, Great. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. That's like five accidents just from oh. my house here. Oh, oh, oh not Lord. much snow. Oh. Not much snow, but it's not it's not it's not it's just the, it's the temperatures. Yes. <laughs> So the drive-in from uh, Park County was pretty exciting, too? Before I had excitement before we left. No problem. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh. But I came from out east, and it's not... Not too bad? No. Yeah. Not till you get into town. Yes. This time, yeah. Yeah, you yeah this time. So you this way I'm, I'm skiing. Yeah, I did. Okay, so I think we're about set for the next item on the agenda then, which is the uh, RAC member, new member of orientation. That's correct. Perfect. Now I just have to find... I just have to find what I misplaced is what I was about to say. Yes, I have many moving parts this morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. And welcome. People behind are not going to be able to see. Okay. All right. Whatever. So, and welcome to our late arrivals. We have real half and half for your coffee this morning. I just want you to know 
Um, that is a treat. So we have this year, at the beginning of this calendar year, we have almost a full third of the rack that is new. And I don't think we actually went through a proper formal orientation a year ago at this time. So hopefully a lot of this information is going to be at the very least a refresher and in some cases new information for everybody here. So I hope we'll, you'll all put up with me for as long as I'm up here and then tolerate Lisa too. We're going to walk you through basically an orientation to the AAA and to the purpose that the RAC serves as well as to the programs that we provide and the funding that we provide to others that provide the programs in our community. And if you do not have a purple folder in front of you when we get to that point, fear not, because we have PDFs of the documents we're going to talk about that we can pull up on the screen for all to see. So first and foremost, we need to talk about the AAA and who and what we are. So what is our purpose? We really, the AAA networks around the country, some five to 600 different area agencies on aging that serve every single county in the United States, Puerto Rico, Guam, the Mariana Islands. I know I'm missing, no, not the Virgin Islands, but I would wish that, that we could add them. No, they're um, not a territory. Um, are all covered <coughs> by area agencies on aging whose specific purpose is to administer funds from the state and federal government that are put into the budgets by the passage of the Older Americans Act in 1965 and the Older Coloradans Act, similarly named, similarly dated, and identical purpose. So if you're 60 or older, then you are eligible for these services. And for our purposes, for this AAA, this applies to residents of El Paso, Park, and Teller counties. So those are the three counties that we serve. There are 15 other AAAs in the state. We'll get to that a little bit later. But basically, the purpose of the AAAs is to take these funds from the state and federal governments, turn them into services, and also to advocate for the needs and concerns of the elderly. So that sometimes puts us in a little bit of a pickle because there's also a limit to what we're allowed to do advocacy-wise. Um, based on the regulations, Volume 10 and the Policy and Procedure Manual that we are handed down um, from the State Unit on Aging. And the State Unit on Aging is the entity within the Colorado State Government that actually receives the money from the federal government, adds the money from the Colorado State budget, and then allocates it to us. And Contrary to what I had thought when I first started here, they don't actually give us a chunk of money. What they do is they say, your allocation is X. And then all year long, as we, a AAA, provide services and as all of our providers provide services, we go to the state and we ask for reimbursement for those services. So we get the money doled out to us as the services are provided which has the dual function of keeping everybody honest and keeping the money in the state coffers until the very last moment. It also means that at the end, if we don't have money, that we, if we have money that remains unspent, we don't have to go through the arduous task, just ask anybody in our accounting department, of returning anything. <laughs> we simply leave it with the state. So that is the purpose of the Area Agency on Aging. And as I mentioned, one need be 60 or older. Or in the case of family caregiver support, somebody in that caregiving dynamic needs to be 60 or older. So you could be 48 and you could be helping with dad who's 73. You're 48. That doesn't have an impact because dad is over 60. Or you could be 85 and your spouse could be 82 and you're both over 60. As long as somebody in that caregiver dynamic is 60 or older, then you can come through us and get services and the Family Caregiver Support Center, um, the program manager 
Kent Matthews will undoubtedly be in the rotation of provider presentations for you later on in the year. And Joe Ruth, who is a longstanding volunteer, there's almost nothing Joe doesn't do, um, <laughs> celebrated author. Does that mean I get in trouble a lot? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but Joe, Joe comes in. I don't know if you all know this. She's in here every Friday making follow-up phone calls on behalf of Kent for the Caregiver Support Center. So she can answer your questions about family caregiver as well. And I apologize for the next slide. This was not originally sourced, as you can see from the quality of it. But if you look, you really get a sense of what the network is like. So at the federal level, what used to be called the Administration on Aging is now the Administration for Community Living, gives the money down to the state units on aging. And depending on what state you're in, they might have slightly different names, but that's the generic umbrella term that describes them all. And then they fund the area agencies on aging, and then the area agencies on aging fund the local service providers. In addition to funding the state units, the Administration for Community Living also funds tribal organizations. They have a separate funding stream. They're underneath the same federal agency umbrella, all of this within the Department of Health and Human Services. But the tribal organizations, as, um, as they do for many other federal programs, they have their own funding stream and their own sets of regulations that do not apply to us. But they are our brothers and sisters in arms, and they come to the National Area, agency on, Area Agencies on Aging Conference every year as well. Are there seniors within the tribes providing senior services? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I mean, it's just not just randomly distributed. There are tribal elder organizations, okay. but they're not area agencies on aging. Gotcha. And they are restricted to providing services within the tribal networks, which typically exist upon the reservation. Okay. And then, as you can see, there are all sorts of other influences on the funding. You can see that the local government has impact. In El Paso County, we don't receive any local funds. But in other counties in Colorado, the county governments provide substantial funding to the Area Agency on Aging. We see this often in Mesa County. The greatest example is Boulder County, where the taxpayers themselves voted to increase their property taxes to provide additional funding to the county which houses the Area Agency on Aging. Cheryl's laughing because she works for El Paso County. Astonishing. <laughs> so we have, we have the two extremes in one state. So. That, and you can see the, the vast number of services that are provided, millions of meals, millions of um, hours of personal care, millions of rides, and on and on. And you hear us talk about this on a smaller scale all year long. Yeah, sure. Quick thought on that. I mean, those are really great numbers, but it's not personalized. And if you think about that from our perspective, we're, we're serving three different counties, and all those little boxes on the bottom there, the blue boxes, those are all services. They all should have a name and, and a face, if you will, so that we can tell a story about what the RAC is doing in individual counties in those specific service areas. That's really an important thing. Just to keep that in mind as we go forward in the new year here, we need to somehow think about personalizing what we're providing the provider organizations out here, they know the faces, but we don't. And we also talk with various people in our own respective areas. So it's important that we get that picture, if you will, and that quick little story. Meals on Wheels or on nutrition services or caregiver support. Each of those needs to have some sort of a personalized uh, message or, or picture, both physically <coughs> and in our minds, so we can tell the story better. Amen. <laughs> so this is a map of the current distribution. Well, the distribution will remain unchanged. Um, the leadership at the different area agencies on aging, which I know is almost impossible to read, um, is updated. But you can see on the map, almost at the dead center where the number four exists, you can see our three-county grouping in light blue directly below the white grouping of the Denver Regional Council of Governments Area Agency on Aging. And the Area Agency on Aging that exists in Grand Junction, which is based out of Mesa County, is responsible for the entire northwestern corner of the state. I don't know how 
anybody living up near Dinosaur National Monument gets senior services, but there are people up there, and the folks in Mesa County serve them. So you can only imagine Pat Ellis, their transportation <laughs> overhead. <laughs> It's pretty staggering when you think about, look at the size of Park County and you could put two, two and a half Park Counties into Moffitt County. So, and the same thing with Los Animas down in the bottom. So moving on, the strategic priority of the Administration on Aging's um, focus. Their priorities are to empower older adults and their families to enable these folks to s remain in their homes as long as possible. And tied to that is the quality of life that they're experiencing. And importantly, for the government, which helps drive the funding for this process, tied to that is the cost. So when somebody expends all of their own financial resources, their step, their next step to getting services in their home or anywhere else is to apply for Medicaid. And Medicaid is a federal program that's administered at the state level. So they apply to Colorado. They apply to Cheryl's office specifically for different kinds of Medicaid programs. And so the, the phrase that you'll often hear is that it costs less to keep somebody at home. And what that means is your home is never considered something that can be sacrificed for your well-being. So if you have, if you have used up all of your liquid assets, you still get to keep your home. And so Medicaid will come and deliver services to you in your home. Home and community-based services is the umbrella term that describes all of that. And it costs the government, both state and federal, significantly less to administer Medicaid to somebody in their home as opposed to providing those identical services to someone in an assisted living facility. So that's the cost savings that you often hear bandied about, especially in these meetings when we talk about why we do what we do. We do it for the quality of life, but the bottom line helps drive the funding that we continue to receive from Colorado and from the United States government. Can I add one thing? I, sometimes I get kind of discouraged because I think that things don't seem like they're going to be getting better, um, like as far as, you know, like as as people go through their resources and they apply for Medicaid or whatever. But um, and so over the years, I thought, oh, Colorado's not doing that great of a job. But just a couple of years ago, I had a, a girlfriend who was struggling with care for her mom out of state. And so I called Barb and got the name of the uh, Alzheimer's Association in the other state and chatted with her for about an hour. They don't have home and community-based services in that state. Period. There isn't those types of programs. Wow. And for the wow. first time in a long time, I thought, Colorado's not doing so bad. <laughs> so I think sometimes we can kind of feel like, oh, there's so much more that we can be doing. But they're, they're, we're not as far down as I once thought we were as far as the things that we were able to provide for people. And so I do think we need to have a balanced understanding of that um, um, sometimes Medicaid gets a bad uh, rap in a lot of different ways. But I think as far as the goal of to empower the elderly within our state to stay home as much as possible and to be able to support them, whether it's through this agency or through other services, we're actually not doing that bad of a job. I, I would never suggest that we are. I think one thing that's important, and we, we talked about this in the context of the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act, the formula that allocates dollars needs updating because Colorado currently suffers under the old formula. It has not been revised for new census numbers, et cetera. But the point, and this is to your point, what Colorado has going for it is we have a body of legislators who understands. We have a United States Senator, Michael Bennett, who has actually received services for his own family members through area agencies on aging. So he's an advocate for us at the federal level. But within Colorado, we have a legislature that has passed increases in funding for the area, agents, area agencies on aging network in the last several years to help offset some of those. Um, it's not a cut at all from the federal government, but it's, an, it's a lack of keeping up with our census numbers. So what that's going to look like in the future, I don't know. 
there are not an infinite number of dollars. And recreational marijuana is currently primarily focused on funding education. So I don't know if there, I mean, that seems to me to be the, between that and tourism, the two biggest revenue generators in this state that have some malleability to them. But thank goodness I'm not a state legislator. That's all I have to say about that. But Colorado is very generous, and I think we're very fortunate to be based here. So really, the AAAs have responsibilities to the seniors, to their family members, but we also have responsibilities to the public. We have to be effective and responsible when we manage the funds that we receive. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the State Unit on Aging holds on to them so that that sort of forces our hand. We have to be responsible if we want to be reimbursed for the services that we deliver. So moving on, national impact, and this goes to Dave's point. These are just a lot of numbers, and they're not nearly as compelling as personal stories. And I would ask if you have any that come up for you, um, or neighbors or friends, people maybe that don't even live in Colorado whose stories you think might be compelling enough for us to weave into a narrative about why we do what we do, I would welcome you sending them to me. Or if you see an article in a newspaper somewhere or online, by all means, please flag that and, and share. We can maybe build some sort of a um, compelling case example to use when we go and speak to public, um, to leaders in the community, or when we go and, and do our outreach to seniors at the different meal sites around the three counties that we serve. And again, national outcomes, the impact of the dollars is significant. Being able to have somebody come and visit you in your home and bring you a meal means that not only do you get the nutrition benefits of those meals, you get the social benefit of interacting with the person that delivers the meal, and that person has the ability to alert someone to a need that they might see in your specific case. You know, it was awfully cold when I brought the meal over and dropped it off, and I think that there's something wrong with the furnace. And Mrs. Smith was really bundled up sitting in her recliner. Or, gosh, Mr. Thomas was absolutely just bereft. His cat had died, and he was crying inconsolably the entire time I was there. And those are, those are you know, insights into somebody's quality of life that can be reported back to the director of the meal program who can then connect that senior with the service that they might need to manage whatever the difficulty is. I know, for instance, at Regional Building here in Colorado Springs, they have a list that they maintain um, of contractors who will, in an emergency, go and fix a furnace when it's five degrees outside. Um, and I know that because my HVAC guy told me that he's on that list. I don't know much more about it than that. But, but there are people who will need something like that and without somebody like Meals on Wheels bringing that to the attention of someone who can take action, those seniors can live significantly isolated lives. And again, you can see caregiving has a huge impact and case management, which is really sort of the distribution of information and services to folks, has the biggest impact of all of those services. And this is just Older Americans Act dollars in Colorado in a five-year period that was reported from 2008 through 2012. So we could, in, we could absolutely update that with a new five-year window, and you know those numbers would go up because we have more seniors, we've had more dollars, and we've been doing more and more work, especially the homemaker and the respite care hours. Those have been skyrocketing. Not the meals so much. I think the meals are more stable than anything else. I'm going to turn this over to Lisa. Are you? I are. Right. Have you not been following the bouncing ball? Phyllis. I don't need a purple one. I have this one from the one you gave me when I first started. Right. We're going to get to that next, but first Lisa's going to finish taking us through the PowerPoint.
Good morning. I'm Lisa Aldridge. I'm the Program Services and Contract Administrator for the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments Area Agency on Aging. I have some of my cards. For those of you who don't already have my contact information in speed dial or in <laughs> autofill <laughs> on your email <laughs> So right now we're going to talk about the services that are provided directly through the AAA. So when you're looking at the word directly, uh, one of the words I use is internal. We have two sets of programs. We have programs that we contract out to the community with our service providers, like the Park County Senior Coal and Silver Key, UCCS. Um, we have 17 contracted providers this fiscal year. These are the services that we offer under this roof with our direct service staff. Just to let you know, the Older Americans Act and therefore the state of Colorado would prefer that the services take place in the community through providers in the community. So every one of these services, we had to request a waiver from the State Unit on Aging, more or less asking for their blessings to, to provide their services in-house. And they are the Family Caregiver Support Center, and that is Kent Matthews is the manager of that program. And most of you have had an opportunity to meet Kent at some point. Most people land on his doorstep in crisis. And many of them relate to not only him, but our other direct service providers that, golly, I wish I had known you guys were here before it got to this point. So we are still dealing with a little bit of name recognition in the community for ourselves. Then we have our long-term care ombudsman, and they oversee the rights of residents in long-term care facilities, including assisted living and um, nursing care facilities, skilled nursing care. And that's in Park Teller and El Paso County. We don't have any long-term care facilities in Park County. Is that correct, Bobby? It's true. <coughs> There's one in Teller County, and the remainder are then in El Paso County. We have our Senior Information and Assistance Center, which includes the Yellow Book, Yellow Book uh, the volunteers that staff our front desk, and everybody pretty much in the area agency on aging has opportunities to share information and assistance about senior services. We contract with Lifeline to provide emergency, personal emergency response systems. Uh, the cliched line, um, I fall in and I can't get up, that's what that is. Then the Senior Insurance Assistance Program, that includes open enrollment period for Part D drug plans under Medicare. We have personal care and home care vouchers. and. I know this is about personal stories, but our personal care vouchers, this time this year compared to this time last year, have increased over 500 percent. So um, we're working on strategies, and the home care vouchers have also increased significantly. So we are employing several different strategies to make that money last. And some of those strategies are, um, unfortunately, possibly putting some folks on a wait list for a short period of time, reducing the number of hours our current clients are getting, and looking at moving some money around um, between services that maybe aren't spending the money as fast, and that would be the internal services. Question. OK, <laughs> yes. Uh, can you go back to the senior insurance? Yes. What is that? The Senior Insurance Assistance Program. The biggest part of that is assistance with the Part B open enrollment under Medicare for the drug plans or any other <coughs> Medicare or uh, Medicaid issue. They offer that assistance. We have a contract for that in more than just our three counties, so there's some uh, 
of the more rural counties, we have contracts to do that as well. Another thing they do for the um, EOBs. Explanation of benefits. Thank you. The E word was escaping me. The explanation of benefits, let's say that a senior or a Medicare recipient has had a hospital stay and they have EOBs piled up to here and bills piled up to here and they don't know what to make of it. Our case managers have been trained and certified to go through all of that paperwork and help that senior figure out what they really need to pay, what the bottom line is, and maybe what they can appeal and what doesn't make sense and what they shouldn't have been charged for so we can assist them with that kind of thing. Can I just make a comment? The assistance... Could I stop you? No. Okay. <laughs> They really get along. <laughs> but, but, but would you want to? No. No. Um, <laughs> um, the, the word assistance does not apply to financial. It, re it applies to counseling. So assistance in resolving your insurance concerns. And, and the Part D open enrollment period is that annual <laughs> cycle where everybody is allowed to change the drug plan that they are paying for. But overall, senior insurance assistance, 365 days of the year, refers to <coughs> counseling about insurance. Yes. And during the Part D enrollment, our counselors slash case managers can only give our clients the information about the top three Part D plans after their information is entered into Medicare.gov. They cannot make... The, the client has to make the decision on which Part D plan they're, they're going to choose. Norma, too. Yeah. Um, you said that there was a 500% increase in the vouchers. Yes. <clears throat> what caused that increase? It's the, the program has been in effect. This is, I think we're going either into the fourth or fifth year, and we're just reaching that point where the awareness in the community and with our other providers has increased the amount of referrals that we're getting in. Carrie, are there any other uh, factors that you think might be? And 500% sounds like a lot, but the, we don't issue as many personal care vouchers as we do homemaker vouchers. So the sheer number probably isn't that big. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. But still, it's 500% more money than what we had allocated to provide that service. Gretchen's in the back of the room. Can you speak to that? Do you, do you have any insight? I just think that the programs have become, you know, people are hearing about the programs. Yeah. I, I really feel. Um, and so that's what's bringing in the <coughs> So I'm just going to repeat that into the microphone so it gets recorded that you're saying that it's about the programs becoming better known in the community and so as a result there's a, a much higher number of requests for the vouchers themselves and so we've just seen that reflected in the number of vouchers issued. Yes. Bobby, you had a question? The senior insurance assistance, one of the things that you didn't mention that has been a huge benefit for Park County is that most of the people providing information about insurance have some personal incentive for being involved and they have their own biases. The senior insurance assistance is one of the few places that people can go where they do not have advice that's leaning one direction or another based on the benefit to the uh, insurance. Not aid. financially gaining. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's <laughs> not a conflict of interest. The other yes. Is that the biggest feedback we've gotten is that we've had people come to Park County to do a presentation for senior insurance assistance, and when they do, the seniors get a chance to ask questions without feeling foolish, mm -hmm. and that is a huge benefit. It's not something that you can <coughs> measure, mm -hmm. but once they start asking questions, there's so much that they feel like they should know because there's this sense that everybody knows how it all works and those questions are necessary before they can make the decisions and so the feedback that program alone is of huge benefit for the the unbiased input and then also the uh, fact, it, it knowledgeable uh, resource but the fact that they can ask the questions without being afraid of looking for 
Yes, Joe. Would you would you explain what the ship when we say your ship office? What is ship? SHIP stands for the State Health Insurance Program. That's it. That's it. So when, when we, every time you call the office and you, you hear them say, and your SHIP office, well, Senior Insurance Assistance is that state program. That's the official name for it. Yes, we do not have used boats or yachts in the parking lot. <laughs> we don't even have dinghies. No. We, 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 are, we are dinghy. Speaking for myself. <laughs> Up yeah, we do. Yes. <laughs> We've got the ship thing covered by this guy. That's how we wrote Dave in. He said, ooh, ships. <laughs> Lisa, I have another question. Personal, in, personal emergency systems lifeline, what is that, that uh, partnership there is with lifeline? We actually contract with lifeline on a per unit basis. Um, and a unit is a contact with a client that has the lifeline. Uh, lifeline will come in and install the units and monitor with the client. They do a monthly check to make sure the client is all right. The unit is available. Should the client have an emergency, they can press a button. They can. They have a unit in their home that they can press a button and it will call lifelines. Who pays huh? for that? We do. We do. The Olders American Act money that okay, comes well, through so the fine. state to us. Okay, so that's financial assistance. No. No. It pays for the lifeline service. They get we the don't service. provide finan direct financial assistance for any programs in this office. Everything pays for a service provided to the client. Okay, I'm a little confused here. Okay, so uh, what does what what do you pay for just a setup and then the person pays for the monthly the person fee. does nobody okay so nobody that receives older Americans Act funding is required to pay for any of that service they are encouraged and asked to contribute to the best of their ability the only eligibility that's required is that they be over 60 there's no means test there's no sliding scale it is fully contribution based as far as what the client pays, and it's completely voluntary. And a client services is not affected at all by their ability or choice not to contribute. So this is a fully subsidized system. Um, the caregiver, uh, the client can contribute to that. That's their way of helping with extending the services or providing more services. Also, all of the providers that we contract with and ourselves are required to make either a 10% match or 25% match in local funds as our contribution to the provision of that service. But no money changes hands with anybody unless a client chooses voluntarily to contribute the funds. So and if I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Cynthia. So that is specifically for a lifeline company because there are other Yes. Uh, senior. Yes, uh, that's who our contract is currently with. And if I can just piggyback on what Lisa has said, in the context of this specific service, Lifeline has a wide array of services, and we give them the bare bones. They don't get the bells and whistles. So, for instance, there's an additional service that I happen to know Lifeline specifically offers in some parts of the country, where when you're wearing the medallion or the wristband, it's actually got an accelerometer in it. So if you fall, so if there's a rapid and abrupt motion, that alerts the system. This system is simply the, I'm going to press my wristband, I'm going to, I'm going to press my medallion alert. And this system, I also think, is landline specific. Yes. I don't know if we have cell service through this particular one. And you're right, there are a number of competitors, but we are contracted with Lifeline, and it's the very base exactly. level okay. of service. And it's, and it's only in your own home and yes. in your perimeter. Your perimeter. perimeter. Um, I can go to my next door neighbor, and in fact, I was showing her how I used it. And what I didn't know was that I had accidentally pressed it, and uh, oh. the fire trucks and EMTs showed up in front, in oh, front of my house oh. <laughs> next door. So I went out to meet them. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just make um, a statement to Cynthia's question? In reality, yes, they are getting financial assistance. 
because we are providing the service for them that they would normally have, have to, pay to pay for themselves. Yes. So I understand though. the confusion. Yes, they're getting financial assistance because they're not paying for the homemaker to come in. They're not paying for the lifeline. They're not paying for those things, and so therefore that's the assistance that then saves them their, uh, their own finances to pay for their medications or whatever. But they are not actually, we're not paying that senior the money that they then use to go get the lifeline. It goes directly to the provider, and then the providers are then, they are required to come and account to us. Correct. How those monies were spent. So I, I understand, I, I see the confusion because yes. they are getting assisted. They're getting financial help because they're not paying for it. But the way that it's done is so that they don't feel guilty or they feel, feel foolish for asking for help. This is what Bobby was talking about earlier. Because they don't have the funds to pay for it. Uh, similar to what um, uh, Pat would have in her situation with the silver key with the transportation. If they can participate with paying for some of the rides, that's great. But we don't want them to not access it because they don't have the money. So it, it, it's, this, it's this balance. Yes, they're getting assistance. <coughs> It helps them with their, with their finances, but that's not the intent. It's the service that allows them to be able to stay home more independently. Does that help? Yes. Okay. On your lifeline that they have, you get these calls about a free lifeline. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Everywhere. I, yeah, I, I keep getting these uh, lifeline things, I guess because of my age. I don't know. Oh, you mean the companies are the companies are calling and giving, <coughs> saying you get a free lifeline. Okay. My question is, okay, after you get it free, then what happens with the service? I would I would question them and ask more specific questions about that. exactly. They're not going to do it for free. No. So well, general, 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 yeah, general. Like ancestry, the first yeah. few weeks are free, but they. Take yeah. yeah, general rule of thumb, if it sounds too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. So question. Er <laughs> well, if I got a free win, you would pay for the service? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, except here. On the list. Wrong list. I just have a question about um, personal care and home care vouchers. Does that pay for the specialized tub that you walk in that is, oh, good question. Uh, you know, schematically tub. sealed or whatever? No, no, no. No, okay. So it pays for somebody to navigate they, the tub. But it doesn't yes. pay for the, the new tub. No. It doesn't, no. doesn't pay for equipment. It pays for a pair of hands and experience. You're asking great questions. I yeah, really ask are. That many I, questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> great. Thank you. I'm learning. I, I was just going to say real quickly with the senior insurance assistance and SHIP, um, my experience is a lot of the seniors are, are pretty knowledgeable about their benefits, which has blown me away, but their kids, um, you know, their kids will say, oh, my mom has Medicare, so that should cover her for the nursing home, and we're like, no. no. <laughs> so yeah. we, we encourage um, you know, sometimes the adult children to come in with their parents or, mm -hmm. or make an appointment. Yes. We also have um, every month, two times a year, sometimes three, but not during the winter, we have what's called Medicare 101, where one of our case managers, insurance counselors, does a presentation of the basics of Medicare. And that's something um, probably a child of an adult adult that's getting Medicare would benefit from too. Yes, Norma. Once a month. But it's two, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. Oh, right. Okay. And then some, and then during the milder months, there's one Thursday evening class periodically, but not during the winter because it's too cold, too, too dark. So the, the last item that you see on there is case management. And case management is when Someone comes in, they see one of our case managers, and all of our case managers are also trained in the senior insurance assistance and the information and assistance and the voucher program. So our case manager will interview a client, complete an assessment, help them determine 
what they need, what is most important, what's the most important need to that client, and then helping them set up the services internally or externally to receive those services that they've considered, that they've identified and prioritized to be most important to them. Cynthia, did you have another question? Oh, well, yeah, going back to the personal care and home care, does that include like um, fixing a wheelchair or? No. <laughs> Where do you get that? I'll be talking about that in a little bit. We have a provider agency in town that does that. Not the wheelchair. Uh, not to, that I know of. I don't know of um, anyone that does wheelchair repairs other than a durable medical equipment store, possibly. So, so they, they don't. You don't kind of like help a senior cover those expenses. Not no, not for a wheelchair. Even if they're disabled. Even if they're disabled. We just don't. Who would they go to? A durable medical equipment supplier, I think, would be the first stop. The yes, there should be some kind of service available where they receive the wheelchair. There's a rental service also a bit. Okay. Does those. Okay. But that that then would be a on financial mm -hmm. right. Um, yeah. For the person. The would be on the individual. I see. But normally it's where they bought the wheelchair, but. Sometimes they rent them, but there's a rental place that does <coughs> fix chairs. I don't know whether it's theirs or mm -hmm. everybody else's, but still the financial is on the people. So that is something that one of our case managers could identify. One of our information and assistance volunteers could help them find a way to get what they need for that wheelchair, whether we provide that service or not, or whether it's even provided by one of our contracted providers. Our case managers and information and assistance staff in the Area Agency on Aging staff in general is not limited to making roles just internally or within our current contracted network. We make referrals countywide times three. I have a quick question about the yes. case management, and I understand this can fluctuate, but um, is there um, a wait for folks to get in to see a case manager? No. Okay, very good. Can, excuse me, Lisa, can someone just call and, and do a case, speak with a case manage, manager in, on the phone instead yes. of having to come to the office? Is um, that as, as good? They can. It's probably not as easy to assess someone only over the phone without being able to see them. But if that's what the client needs, then the case manager will work with them to the best of their ability. Thank you. And there are going to be some times when they need to come in, especially if they're uh, applying for Medicaid and need help with their application. There's just, yeah. Okay, that's our internal programs. Any more questions? I got one more. Yes. What's the difference between home care and homemaker? Home, ca homemaker and home care. There's not. It's two. Same. Two. Yes. Same it's thing. The same. Um, yes. Thing. Okay. Because you mentioned homemaker, and I was. Homemaker is yeah. That probably should say personal care and homemaker vouchers. Oh okay. We'll fix that. Yes, we will. Senior Information and Assistance Center offers so much more than just information. And it is literally a, a clearinghouse. It is a live voice to the information that's on the network of care and in the yellow book. Um, we also have the adult Medicaid programs and veterans benefits book. So all of these bullet points that you see on this list are the benefits of the Information and Assistance Center and, and so much more. And we have such an appreciation for the volunteers that work at our front desk and manage this on a daily basis. Um, Norma, I'm going to call you out. Mm -hmm. Norma is one, one of our wonderful volunteers. Could you speak for maybe just a few seconds on the experience as a volunteer? Just compare when you walked in the door the first time to, to now, and the what's that look like? The desk is really an experience because you get to speak to seniors uh, with all kinds of needs. Sometimes they are homeless. Sometimes they are uh, unable to get from here to there and they need transportation. Or they don't have meals and they're looking for 
meals to be delivered to their home or perhaps uh, get commodities. We have that information available on our rack. We also have some wheelchair uh, information that I will get for you at Greg. But it's a very interesting um, <laughs> job to have. It's a volunteer job and I really enjoy it because I can actually help people. When they call in to me, um, I never really know for sure what is going to be required. But by the same token, we have the counselors, the case um, managers who accept the calls that we transfer to them and they know all of the information about the Medicare and the Medicaid situations. Uh, they are just wonderful to help our seniors that need the help. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. Uh, about the Yellow Book and other publications, are those available in either audio or Braille? What was the first thing you said? No. Yeah. They're, I know they're not available in Braille, but what was the first thing? Audio. Audio? No. No. No, but on the, the yellow book does exist as a PDF on our website, so somebody with the correct technology on their own computer mm -hmm. could possibly have the yellow book contents read to them if their software was oh. the kind that could scan a PDF to do that. See. But no, it does not exist, and it doesn't exist in Spanish or Korean or any other um, non-English language, unfortunately. That's, that's a hurdle that we would love to clear, but then we have to clear it every single year. And it's an additional expense, and we have just sort of resolved to publish the Yellow Book in English and distribute it as widely as we possibly can up to this point. At some point in the future, that would be an ideal scenario. I'm not trying to hurry this along, but okay. uh, we're trying to take a break here in about a couple oh. of minutes. So you got a couple okay. more slides, then we'll take a break after that. Sure. <laughs> Two more more words. <laughs> okay, we're going to be talking about more services. Um, these are the services that are contracted through our local agencies. Uh, assistive technology is offered for folks with visual impairment. Audiology and hearing aids is offered through Peak Vista. Caregiver counseling is offered through U, uh, UCCS, as is respite. Uh, no, respite is with Park and Teller counties. Yeah. And case management. Uh, a lot of our agencies have case management. Silver Key, Park, Teller County, they all three have case management. The chore services, Cynthia. The chore services are where clients can get home repair, household maintenance projects done that will increase the safety of the home. We ha currently have a provider that's doing grab bars. We hope to expand that. We just haven't had a lot of people apply for that service to provide it. How about a ramp? Um, Silver Key has, um, <laughs> has referrals for ramps, so there are a go-to for, for ramps. Uh, UCCS provides counseling service for our SOS program, which stands for Save Our Seniors. Is that right? Seniors. SOS? SOS? Yes. Yes. Okay. And that's uh, a collaboration through Silver Key and UCCS. So uh, the client comes in through Silver Key, and Silver Key screens the client. They have a quick roundtable case management session regarding these clients that have presenting mental health issues, let me be clear on that. And then if um, they meet the bar for needing further service other than a community referral, then they are referred to UCCS for counseling sessions. And I believe they get six to eight sessions under the grant for counseling for mental health. We have dental hygiene, and Michelle Vaca is here with Senior Mobile Dental. Anyway. It's Michelle. And we have evidence-based health promotion, which is provided through the YMCA. And we have a new uh, program gearing up at the Consortium for Older Adult, well Elder Adult Wellness. And that is going to be chronic disease self-management. The two programs at the YMCA are fall prevention, they're a uh, matter of balance, and moving for better balance. And like the mental health, first aid that our presenter talked about, they're evidence-based programs 
that the trainers are trained to run the programs and the programs are ran bullet point by bullet point based on the training of the facilitator and the curriculum. Uh, emergency response systems are in Teller County, but I don't think it's Lifeline and I don't see Ralph. And then there's also more family caregiver services available. Any questions about any of these? There's not many that are different up there. Legal. Legal services. Catch. Oh, look. Another There's another page. <laughs> I thought I was done. <laughs> I thought that was short. <laughs> we really are an efficient operation here. <laughs> Did you say inefficient or an efficient? <laughs> I can only speak for myself. <laughs> okay, we have homemaker services, which um, Park County also has a voucher program for the homemaker, as does Teller. So we're all do using vouchers to provide that service. Uh, legal assistance, which is through Colorado Legal Services. There is a certain percentage of money that we uh, that is brought down from the state that is expected to be used to provide legal services. Don't ask me the percentage. I can't remember it right now. Uh, we have congregate meals. We have home-delivered meals. Nutrition counseling, which... Uh, comes with, this says congregate meals, but it's now available through congregate meals and home delivered meals. Um, we set aside a little bit of funding internally for nutrition counseling for rural clients. There's nutrition education, which talks about food safety. Clients get a flyer every month with their meals. The personal care, which is us and prospect home care and hospice. Safety renovations, which also falls under chore. Yes, and it all falls under chore. Okay. Mm -hmm. And transportation, there's assisted transportation for folks who need more assistance than curb to curb. And then there's transportation for folks that can meet their ride at the curb, get on the bus seat themselves, and buckle up. You have a number that's kind of a clearinghouse for transportation, don't you? Yes. Yeah, that's wonderful. Peak ride. Yeah. And the joint call, scheduling call and dispatch center is growing. Thank you, Cheryl. She has to go and catch an airplane. Oh, Bye. Yes. <laughs> have a safe trip. Thanks. These are all of our wonderful agencies. We have seven, currently have 17. Do you have this available for us? Uh, yes, we do have uh, brochures. <coughs> Carrie? The presentation is, I think, what you oh, said. Oh, the presentation? Well, <laughs> This like is really list. good. Yeah, I like the list. <laughs> yeah, we have a list. It's not in our folder. Okay. Right. We can do that. Thank you. Yes. And to be eligible for services, you have to be 60 or older. No means testing. Donations are solicited and welcomed. And as I said earlier, there's no denial of service based on someone's inability or choice not to contribute to the service. And there are the contact numbers. The, Why don't we take a five-minute break here? Okay. Did I have anything else? That's it right now. Boy, that was All right. That was a lot. That was a lot. Yeah. Which one? Yeah. <laughs> Our heads are spinning, aren't they? Yeah. Fair play. Okay. They're all good questions. Every one of them. So, Joe, all of these people listed in here, are they BBB approved or uh, screened or, you know, I, or are they I, just... I, no, 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 no. They're, they, they, we personally call each one and verify their information each year. 
But, uh, and, and where there, and, and I don't know about the BBB approval. We have to ask Carrie and, and, uh, and Lisa about that. But they're all verified as, as okay, I'm gonna try to move friendly. This but you know whether they're BBB approved, I think they are, but I don't want to We'll go more yes. quickly after. Because Could I we delay on the package? So, so we get through the words. We can really okay. be certain the people you call on this well, is not going to take the senior for a ride. And and that we, we, let me you know, let me come over. Let me yeah. come over and talk to you. I, I, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's a big yeah. list, but you know, sometimes seniors get. Well, yeah, I haven't. Seniors get scammed. Yes. That's fine by me. Yeah, no, that's fine by me. But I do want to go over it. I think it's. Well, I think you're absolutely right, but. Like he's going to leave here. Cheryl had to leave. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Senior Blue Book. Senior. It's called the Blue Book. Senior Housing. It's got the same kind of information. And they are. Their guy is paid for by advertising. This is paid for with our money. So, so if in order for it, for us, to, we want to verify our name is on here, and we That's verify right. all of the information. That's right. Is this what you say you do? Yes. Is this who you are? Is this your address? Are you yes. legitimate people? Yes. And you so, stand behind so, your product. Yes. So, so this is a huge expense. This is probably the most expensive. This is this is the only one of its kind in the United States. Really, we have the best information in the United States. So, uh, and and I and, and that's verified by um, by the uh, the 4A the uh, National Organization of Area Agencies of Aging. And when we take this book to that to those meetings and people look at it, no one can compare to what we have here. At least that's the way it's been in the past. I hope somebody can surpass us because that means it's better information. But you are so right. What is the validity of this information? Mm -hmm. That's what you're really asking. That's right. What is the safety and the, the safety, validity? Right. Senior calls, you know, I mean, it, fix my leaky roof and then the roof but isn't none of, fixed. But, or, but none of that is going to be in here. Don't have leaky roof advertising in here. It's, it, as you go through the, 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 the kind of services, they're mostly health care related, not, um, not housing, not lawn services, those kinds of things you're not going to find in here. That's a public internet now. I was going to say telephone book, but oh well, I'm old. No, <laughs> you're no older than I am. <laughs> but, 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 uh, so these people do take out advertising, but it's not the fact that they. Uh, but they're legitimate. Yeah. They're legitimate, and, and, even and if gonna, they're. And, and I'm Thank you. These are the eggs for you. Stuck out here. Now, in some ways, now I don't want to. I, I don't want to say the blue book offers some different information, which is very helpful. Right. Compare. <coughs> is this her notebook? Yes. 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 Okay. That's Nancy's. But compare. All right. but compare uh, books together is helpful. Uh -huh. But, but they are, that's not my business. This is, this is public service information paid by our own money. Uh huh. So you stand. Yeah, that's stand the difference. That's the difference. Are you learning? I am. You well, got one of my cards, right? Yes, I so do. If there's any questions that you have well, that we don't that, have Lindsay. time to question, right. to answer, you can just. Me or come see me. And my office is the middle one. In the right middle. there with the, oh. see the bug staring <laughs> yes. through the window? That's my office. <laughs> yeah, those, those slides were very, very helpful. Thank you. Because then we know what is covered or where we're supposed right. to. And then the list of, of the association, like UCCS, they're the ones that are doing this. Right. And I think that's helpful. So yes. Because they're the ones that are going to be applying for the grants. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>
asking about wheelchairs. Yeah, wheelchairs. These are all brochures that are in the front lobby that we give to folks who are coming in, walking in the door, but the senior has to pay for it. Well, yes, there's no assistance. But this page is in your folder. Oh, it is? Okay. And these are the, 12, the 17 different... Um, Vendors that we oh, so it's already it's in here. here? I think. That's really? what I was told. That you I guess you know what we should have done was go through our folder. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I can give you another copy just in case. Do I? Oh, it's inside here. It's inside here. It's oh, it's the, hidden. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. Great. So you have that. Oh, okay. And I thought, well, I'll give you these things. These are all you can be interested in. Our, this uh, well, information is available in our lobby to all of our seniors walking in. The okay. Now, so you can look at this. You can use them or not. It's up to you. But if you don't want them, no, I'll refile them. No, it's fine. Uh, quickly run to the bathroom. There you go. Have we had? I do. But I'll do a So this is yeah. I was looking at this. Maybe you live downtown someplace. I live here. Anyway, you can look at these things and if you have a But I work down yeah. on the right These are not. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I don't think some of them might be, but some of them. Yeah. I love my great. I love off the garden of the gods. Yeah, and that's okay. where I live. Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah. Okay. If I could uh, sort of encourage everybody to kind of reassemble here. I think we've lost our, almost lost our quorum. <laughs> well, let's, let's well, let them all drift back in. Yeah, yeah. Phone calls and everything. Oh, that's when you get up there and go. Yeah, I wish I could do that. I've never been able to do this. This one here, Village to Village to be a long way. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, that might get a lot of attention. Yeah, do the Cheech and Chong thing. Class! Oh, what's this? <laughs> I draw two of them. A lot of folks oh, here won't know book. that, but yes. <laughs> just so that you can so, so they're different? Yes, it's a different book. But this one you say has advertising. Oh, this one well, it has Thank advertising, you. but it's paid so for with advertising. <laughs> but it has good information in here. You just have to know that. Yes, yeah, so you need a bigger. Just, we'll straggle in here, but in the interest of time, I'd like to keep the meeting to about two and a half hours max, something like that, so that we all kind of have, have things to do. So at this point, uh, what I'd propose is that on the agenda it says for the RAC member packet review, and I've talked to Carrie, and I think that we'll just set that one, move it down the agenda a little bit. We'll jump right into the director's report. We have the email from uh, Joe Urban. We should have mentioned that he's the director of the AAA. He's in a meeting in Denver at this time. And uh, there's an email that he sent out this morning. I think that's the report that Kerry has on that. Since she's talking right now, how about if I'll jump to the next item? I'll just take, I'll take, the, I'll take the, uh, the next thing here. So the right member biographies. I think everybody got an email on that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and the idea behind that, again, sort of as, as the overview, was to sort of make sure that we all understood, okay, where are we coming from? What's the background and what are the interests? I thought that we it was have? excellent. Thank and you. And to me, we haven't seen the full, pull together everything, but I think that that's what Carrie and Lisa have said, that they put that together just for us to look at and just to have uh, for sharing and trying to say, oh, gee, I didn't know that Norma had a spe specific interest or background in this thing. And I think that really makes for synergy and activity between meetings among the members here, which I think is an important piece. Uh, so that's the, that's the biography piece. I just kind of jumped uh, slid you down one more thing since you had the director's report. I'm, I'm talking about right. biography. You just keep going. Tell me when okay. you want me to jump in. So <laughs> the biographies, uh, hopefully everybody's had a chance to look at that and provide their inputs. And hopefully... I don't... I only have about half okay. of the bios right. back, I didn't which is why it. they haven't been stapled together. I, I, I will distribute those at the February RAC meeting if everybody... And I'll send out a reminder. No, okay, it's an important thing, I think, especially for the new members, so they can kind of get a sense of, okay, who's this Dave person, and who's Barb, and who's, who's Joe, that type of thing. I yeah. thought it was excellent. So I, okay. I really appreciate it. So that's the biography it. piece. If you haven't submitted one already, please do, uh, so that we can get this out in February. Okay, table talk. Did we send out an email on that? I think we did, didn't we? Or not? No? No. no. Okay. No, table. we were going to talk about okay, it. Okay, we're going to talk about that. Okay, so... At the December meeting, after the December meeting, uh, we had basically a, a, a tables were moved around, and we had people, members, that had an opportunity to just plop down at the table and sort of engage in 
uh, coffee, talk over food, and I thought it was very worthwhile. Joe also did, and to me it was a uh, opportunity for just social conversation, but also finding out more about individual members, their interests, mm -hmm. things that were going on in their lives. So the, it sort of prompted the idea for uh, coming up with a means for communicating more informally in addition to what we do here. This is all sort of, you know, here's some information and you, some quick questions and some quick answers, but it doesn't build a relationship, nor does it really necessarily advance the organization as a whole. So the idea for Table Talk is that it's a, it'll be a one-page email or so, and the, you know, I've, I've prepared one of these, we've kicked it around, Joe and I talked about it, we've met with Kerry and with Lisa and with Joe, and the idea is that uh, it's a way of, uh, regular way of more broadly and hopefully effectively sharing ideas, interests, and concerns. So that the, the idea is that, and it's basically has three parts to it, uh, it would come out after each rack meeting, within a few days after each rack meeting, so it's something that goes on between meetings, it's not necessarily, these would not be on the agenda, this is more informal stuff that you individually as members in Eastern El Paso County or in Park or in Teller or in a particular town are aware of things that you think have value for sharing across here, so it's another means for communicating. So it would have opening notes, the three parts, opening notes, commentaries, and closing notes. Essentially, it's pretty, and you'll get a copy of this coming out here shortly. Uh, but the commentaries, like uh, what I prepared on this one as a sample, uh, Joe Urban is a member of the Strategic Action Plan on Aging, the SAPCA at the state level, and he gave us a rundown at the December meeting of what was in it. But it's not something you can take just verbally and copy quickly, copy down. So what I pulled out from his report and stuck it in here. Now with this information coming to you on email, you'd be able to say to your friends or to the uh, town or county officials or anybody else you meet, hey, the SAPCA, here's some really key things that are important. All it does is sort of increase our ability to get information out to others more effectively. I think that's an important thing. Uh, and the closing notes are just a, uh, you know, just a quote or something like that. Uh, so there's a schedule that will come out. It will all be self-explanatory. Nancy mentioned that, and, and showed me an article here uh, on break, on the village yes. concept in, I think, mm -hmm. Teller County or in Park County or something like that. That's exactly the type of information that would be in here. Skinny it down. We don't want to bury people with another 17-page <laughs> attachment or anything. Skinny is okay. I like that. <laughs> but, but, but put it in, in the sense of like the talking points or bullets or a short synopsis, so that you can quickly take that and say, gee, here's re that's really good information. I didn't know that was available, or I didn't know that was going on in the county. Or there's a meeting that is open for uh, attendance. I mean, the, is it Woodland Park? Yes. Yeah. That's doing it. They're in process of developing the idea. Yeah. So yeah. it would be, I think it would be good. I'd like to go to one and, and listen. Yeah. So, <laughs> like and again, the idea here is to uh, introduce the idea and then say that this will be coming out on a monthly basis. And initially, since I kind of came up with the idea, I mean, I've got my, I, send, I push the button and send it to Carrie and she sends it out to everybody. But it doesn't have to be, nor should it be, Dave doing this. So if somebody else wants to take that on, that'd be a great thing to do. I can talk to individual, whoever it is that would like to do that, or a couple people. It's one of those things, again, from, I don't want the chair to be doing these things. I think it's important that the members say, hey, I could do that. That's really interesting. That's a neat way of sort of introducing yourself and also getting information shared across the, uh, across the counties. So Dave, are you saying you're looking for a couple of people to, to put those out or, or that each of us can put it out to the group? Let's, let's table that one, we'll talk afterwards. Okay. I think you'll see it when it comes out, there's an explanatory email okay. and the rest of it kind of leads, leads you into that. But I wanted to make sure we got that out on the table. Uh, so, let's see, uh, table, let's see, subcommittee chairs. One of the responsibilities of the chair is to come up with uh, chair of persons for the technical review subcommittee, which is the organization that looks at all the proposals that comes in from the providers asking for money and justifying their requests. And that TRS subcommittee is the one that meets uh, for multiple times, very important one, and makes the recommendation, reviews and evaluates the proposals.
proposals, and then he makes recommendations to the RAC as a whole. The RAC then says yes or no, and then goes on to the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, and they ultimately accept the recommendations, and the money flows to support seniors across the three counties here. So the TRS subcommittee, uh, I chaired that. Jerry's been an integral member. There have been others, and, and uh, uh, Phyllis has been on that, and I'm sure they're missing Betsy. somebody else. Betsy. Betsy, Betsy was. and Cheryl. Cheryl, I uh, talked with Francis. Her and Francis. Myself. Yeah, Cheryl has agreed to be the chair of the uh, technical review subcommittee. So that's an important responsibility, and, and we're really happy and <coughs> to thank her publicly for agreeing to do that. Okay. That's, okay. that's an important role. The other uh, subcommittee, established subcommittee we have is membership, and there that's the one that really comes up and says, okay, and taps Dave or somebody else on the shoulder and says, would you like to be or would you consider running for chair or for uh, other other roles? That's or have all of you sitting here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So so Wendy has been chairing that, and she has agreed to uh, chair that again and continue her chair responsibilities, and we thank her publicly yeah. for doing that. So our two subcommittees that are now both have chairs, Cheryl and uh, Wendy. So that's a good thing. Uh, let's see. Uh, there was something else I wanted to talk about. Uh, annual goals. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think is important for an organization. Uh, we're, we're really focused on individual presentations and providers and services. But I think as an organization, we should be thinking about, okay, so what is it as a group? What is it that we'd like to really focus on in this this year? Uh, so I, I'll, I'll send out we'll send out an email with suggestions perhaps. But at the February meeting, I think it would be worthwhile to take a few minutes on the agenda and say, okay, here's two or three things that we could focus on as a group, both as a group, but then individuals taking it out into the respective communities. <coughs> I think is really the key. So we'll try to do that for that February meeting as well. So I'll look forward to it, and I encourage each of you to think about, okay, so what are the goals? Sort of the big area, big picture, that we should be doing that would benefit all of the communities. Not so much individual programs, but perhaps just others. I'll leave it at that. And I think... Uh, I'm tired listening to you. Exactly. <laughs> so now it's your turn. Okay, now, it's, now, you're, now we're back on agenda. And this is back on Kerry's talking about the director's report and then the packet review. Right. So um, <coughs> Joe Urban sends his regrets to the RAC. He is, as you know, the chair of the Colorado Commission on Aging for 2017. He is also, in the role of AAA director, a member of the Colorado Association of Area Agencies on Aging. And today, those two organizations share a joint meeting in Denver. So this sort of <coughs> coincides, this is an alignment of planets, if you will, that takes place only about every three years, according to Joe. And it is a um, command performance for him. So we lost out to these two other organizations, but he'll be back for our February meeting. But he asked me to convey a couple of things to you. So um, in addition to welcoming Dave in the role of chair and thanking Joe in her previous two years as chair of the RAC, um, Joe Urban wants to share with the RAC a couple of things. So there's not much that's been going on since the RAC last met December 8th. As you know, it's pretty much a quiet time of the year. So there hasn't been very much to report except now the state legislature is in session and they are moving forward at an accelerated pace trying to make up for the quiet time of the holidays. So up to this point, over 250 different bills have been entered into committees for, entered into the record and then distributed to committees for initial work at hearings. Certainly, it will not be 250 that actually make it to the floor of the chambers for vote, but the legislature is moving fastly and furiously forward. I know that PPACG is watching one specific bill, the number of which escapes me, but it has to do with creating a body that will study transportation around the state. Does Pat, does that sound familiar to you, Bobby, or either of you? 
aware. I'll see if I can pull that information up in my email because I had something somewhere about it. But there are pieces of legislation that are on the floor that will be discussed um, that will be coming the way of the rack in terms of information items. State Bill 17001. I'm sorry, 011. I got my numbers transposed. And it is a study of transportation access for people with disabilities. That's the title of the, of the bill at this point. Um, but it includes input from the area agencies on aging. So we'll be following it. A little closer to home, what you may be aware of, and not I know not everybody is, but the executive director of the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments was um, had his contract not terminated, but the PPACG board at the January 11th board meeting voted not to renew Rob McDonald's contract as the executive director of our organization. So the board will be launching a national search for a replacement. And um, Rob's contract continues through 7 p.m. on Friday, February 10. And I don't think the search will start before then, but the board of directors will be searching for a new executive director to run PPACG. In the interim, Rick Sonnenberg, who is one of our program managers here for the Pikes Peak Regional Transportation Authority, is our acting executive director. And Rick has the joyous job of reviewing requests and <coughs> signing off on all sorts of things, including payroll, which we are grateful to him for. <laughs> um, so we do have somebody filling the role of ED in Rick Sonnenberg as acting ED until such time as Rob McDonald's um, successor has been identified and has come on board. That process is likely to take several months. So in the absence of a full-time and permanent ED, we have Rick. And we certainly will have Joe Urban back as our AAA director in situ in February. So just so you know, it will be business as usual with Rick responsible for signing off on things in the interim. And that's a lovely segue into the no wrong door work that um, Rick has been brought up to speed on really quickly. Poor guy. Um, and that proposal that we keep talking about at all these meetings and catching you up on, that proposal is in the final stages, and I will be delivering it to the Colorado Department of Health Care Policy and Finance on Monday on six individual flash drives. That's how it has to be handed over. We can't submit it electronically, or I should say we can't submit it over the Internet. It is electronic in that it's going to be submitted on flash drives. So that's five duplicate flash drives for the main proposal and one additional flash drive for the finances. And I am in the process of working with our consultants. I've been emailing them this morning during the meeting um, to get some of the final questions answered and the final pieces in place. And I'll be going to Denver on Monday morning. And Pat, do you have, oh, I should probably review the eight entities that are participating. So PPACG, as the Area Agency on Aging, Silver Key, Rocky Mountain Options for Long-Term Care, the Independent Center, the Resource Exchange, Community Health Partnerships, El Paso County Department of Human Services, and and community health partnership in the form of Community Care Southern Colorado. But yeah, Community Health Partnership is the parent organization. And, and, and Wendy knows that because her husband Joe works for CHP. I'm sorry. It's, it's the evolution of the Aging and Disability Resources for Colorado program. So it is streamlined access to long-term services and supports. 
And it's going to require, if we are grant, well, regardless of who gets the pilot, we're, we're applying for funds for a pilot site. Regardless of who gets it, it's going to require that the Department of Healthcare Policy and Finance change some of the regulations that they're currently funding services under. It's going to require a paradigm shift in the state of Colorado <coughs> at a significant level. And so we're all hopeful that that paradigm shift is going to actually take place because if it doesn't, the pilot will not be successful because of the regulations that control the funds as they're currently administered. So keep your fingers crossed. If well, regardless of who receives the awards, the awards will be announced at the end of February, and the funding would start April 1, 2017. And the total amount we're asking for? Uh, our region is somewhere in the four hundred dollars to $500,000 range, is my understanding. Bobby, you had a question? Is this the funding that follows the person paradigm shift? Yeah, it once at one point was money follows the person. Yeah, it's all, it's a bunch of things that are all rolled together now. I mean, every time we turn around, Hickbuff says, oh, and this funding stream. It's also currently going to include the funding for all the HCBS waivers, all of them, 12 or 13, that are currently administered by the community center boards and the single entry points around the state. So it's significant. Regardless of who receives the grants, it's still going to be within Colorado. So even if we don't get the grant here, it's going to make changes throughout the state eventually. If we don't get the grant, then the pilots will still operate for one year with a possible extension to 24 months in several spots around Colorado. So they're talking about three urban pilots and two rural pilots. And so if we don't get the pilot program, the pilots will be distributed around Colorado and services here will continue on as they have been delivered for years. If we do get the pilot, we will also get dispensation from HICPUF to start changing the way the process works locally. And by locally, I mean El Paso County only for the pilot program. Mm -hmm. And then... I think it's a change in the near future for all of us, but we would like to be a part of the pilot. I think in the next three to five years for the entire state, and this is being this is being done all over the country. We're only talking about it in Colorado. And Pat wanted to. You had your hand up. Did you want to add something? No, I didn't Did I hel I hallucinate it again? <laughs> I'm sorry. I saw Bobby's hand go up, and I thought I saw your hand go up at the same time. It's on me. I'm, I'm seeing things. So I'm sorry. I know it's complicated, and I know every single time we talk about this, I rehash a lot of stuff. Um, but we're building to a wild crescendo here on Monday, and hopefully it will result in the pilot program coming to El Paso County. We were originally going to be El Paso and Teller, but because Hickpuff said you can be urban or you can be rural, we decided that our strength was urban and that if we get the pilot, it will be very easy to expand to Teller County and then to Park County. So for right now, we're focusing on El Paso because of our urban, our urban strength. With those eight partners, we really, we're really a very collaborative group. So, so that's enough. Are you done now? I'm not done until Monday. <laughs> Well, but yes, I'm done with that's that. That's because you're taking a trip. Yep, we've got packet review to engage in. So we probably got about another 10 minutes, okay? Hold on, hold on if you can. To what? <laughs> so Lisa and I are going to finish the rack member orientation now. For those of you who do not have a purple rack packet, we're going to go over the contents of the rack packet by plopping them up on the screen for all to see. So do not despair. Um, on the left side of 
And I'm going to spare everybody looking at the first three items I'm going to talk about. But for those of you with a purple folder, on the left side of your folder, you'll see that we have included the four-year plan, which is basically the strategic plan that the Area Agency on Aging submits to the State Unit on Aging every four years. And it's our strategic plan under which we operate. And it includes information that you will also find on the right-hand side of your packet. But it talks about how we target the populations, the, the region that we serve, the purpose that we're trying, the goal we're trying to achieve. We also have on the left side of your packet a copy of the RAC bylaws, which are relatively parallel to the PPACG bylaws. And in that context, they are somewhat inflexible. But they do direct the formation of the subcommittees, the appoint appointment of chair for a term of two years. That was an amendment we made several years ago with PPACG board's approval. We found that the continuity of a two-year term really led to a strengthening of the leadership of the RAC. And then lastly, um, a summary of the Older Americans Act. So now you know why we're not going through all three of those items individually. If you look on the right-hand side, of your RAC packet, the first item you will see is the RAC member responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And the responsibilities are relatively basic. The RAC advises the AAA staff and the director on the development implementation of the four-year plan, advises and recommends on the policy and procedures manual that the AAA operates under. And that's our own internal manual, not the one from the State Unit on Aging that requires work at the state level for amendment. Reviews and comments on policies and programs and actions and affecting older adults in the context of um, public input processes and being involved in older adult focused opportunities in the community. You have to have a sincere interest in the quality of life of seniors. And what you may remember is that the REC bylaws and state regulations call for 50% or more of our advisory council to be a consumer. So 50% or more of the REC is 60 or older. I qualify now. Yay. <laughs> And, <laughs> and to that end, I think it speaks to the sincere interest. And for those RAC members who are under 60, I know you also hold a sincere interest in improving the quality of life. You've got to be able to come to meetings, and you must be able to use a computer to access the meeting materials. Those are basically the member requirements. And Lisa is going to come up and walk you through what should be sequentially, because I opened them backwards in sequence, so they should be. There's one up here if you want to use it. Here's one up here. Should be sequentially the items as you dig down layer by layer in your packet. Good morning again. So... As I was speaking earlier, I was talking about limited resources. And Carrie had mentioned that from the federal level, our funding has not been increasing over the several <coughs> years. But the state has been um, helping offset some of that by increasing our state funding a little bit year by year. So since those resources are limited, what we as an area agency on aging are required to do is to give priority to clients over 60 who may be unserved or underserved due to circumstances in their life, such as uh, being a low income, being frail or disabled, being part of a racial or ethnic minority. Here's the income scale. Uh, if they live in a geographically isolated area, so when we're looking at spreading these resources, this 
especially if, a, um, if we're looking at starting a waiting list for services, this sheet is used to help us use these priorities to put our wait list in order. So it's not as simple as, okay, you went on the wait list in January, you're number one, February number two, March number three. This has to be taken into consideration when those wait lists are developed. Some of our providers will use this to provide the service to begin with before they even have a wait list to prioritize who gets their services first. So this helps keep us in line with that requirement to make sure that the most needy, unserved or underserved people in our areas have access to those services. Some folks in our more rural areas don't even have uh, the ability to reach out for services. I uh, knew a case manager one time who loaned a client her phone because the client didn't have a landline, didn't have a cell phone, didn't have in internet, didn't have any way to contact them or us or anybody. Probably wasn't, I, I wouldn't necessarily give my phone to anybody, but I would certainly look at resources to help that person get a phone. Yes. A bunch of things to go through here, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Can we kind of roll through them? This is more detail, right? Yes. This one's very detailed, so kind of. Yes. It's I will. Detail. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Carrie, where are they? They're under PDF. You, if, so close that and then just close, go to the top right, close that one, and then select nope, yes, close current tab. There you go. Okay. Nope. Lisa, you were perfect. Take your mouse off. There you go. That's your next okay. document. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. It's too easy to follow. <laughs> okay, uh, these are our current providers and the services that they provide and the type of funding that they receive to provide this service. It also includes their name and their address and their address. There's no phone numbers on there. Um, you can look on the network or care, Google any of them, and you will be able to get their phone numbers. So that's there should you need it. These are the service definitions for the services that we currently offer. And you have those to refer to. And I was um, telling Cynthia earlier that if you guys have any questions in the, that aren't like burning a hole in your brain, I will be happy to answer those one-on-one -on -one personally with you. You can just give me a call or stop by my office. I'm in the middle office. So... It depends on the day. <laughs> I think I might need a mental health day on Monday when Carrie's grants do. <laughs> uh, this is an organizational chart for the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments Area Agency on Aging as it currently stands. This is our inclement weather policy. This is pretty important. I was a little concerned this morning because we did get a little bit of snow. And what you would do on a rack day or any day that you're coming here for some purpose in the morning and there's weather, if you call our number after 6 a.m., and I usually call about 6.05 because the recording has to be changed, so I want to give folks that change the recording the time to get that done. If you call after 6 a.m., it'll tell you if we're going to have a delayed opening or if we're closing for the day. If we have a delayed opening on a rack day, then the, usually the delay is two hours. If that happens, the meeting would start at 10 instead of 9. If we're closed, then you're just off the hook for that month. And it's not the yellow book number. Correct. It is the main number for PPACG. It's this number. Right. That's important. Yes. Good to know. Very. 
Uh, this is the state map of all the area agencies on aging, which you saw earlier in the PowerPoint. How am I doing, Dave? Good. Is that quick enough? Is that quick enough for you, Dave? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so uh, area agency on aging acronyms. I think we've all had the experience. Uh, the last place I worked, it was called Alphabet Soup. And it's really funny when you go from one system to another and you're used to an acronym meaning one thing and you go to another agency and it's an acronym. So I would assume that it means the same thing it used to mean, but not necessarily. So these are all your acronyms. If any of us ever use acronyms and you don't know what it is, please ask. I try not to do that, but sometimes we just fall into habits. Robert's Rules of Order. In case you have insomnia. Yes. <laughs> We're trying to get a patent for the cure just based on this. That's it. So just a, just a couple of more things that are of actual importance in your packet. On the right-hand side, you will find a collection of all of the brochures for all of the programs here at the AAA. The big purple one, Barb, could you hold up the large purple one? Yes. Has an insert in the center. And um, Norma took a moment and went around and passed that insert out. It, and Dave's holding it up. Thank you, Dave. So those are all of our current providers. That insert will change every year on July 1st as we either include new <coughs> providers, drop old providers, or have providers add additional services. But that's a quick reference guide for where um, the money that goes outside of this agency goes. Also, in that little packet, um, if I can sure. borrow, you'll find RAC member volunteer business cards with space for you to write in your contact information so that if you're ever out at a public event and you want to give somebody a way to reach you, because you're representing the AAA and you're on RAC business or you're wearing your RAC hat in that moment, even if you didn't go into that event with the intention of networking about the RAC, but you find yourself doing it, yay, awesome you, <laughs> these are business cards. So you should have a dozen business cards in new packets, and I am always happy to provide RAC members with additional cards as you burn through them. There are also name tags. If you lose your name tag, Wendy Farr, I'm very happy to make you a new one. <laughs> <laughs> I have two of them, and I know where both of them are at this very moment. They're not on me, but they're at home, and I know right where they are. And you have two because? I lost one, and she made a new one. And <laughs> <laughs> but it's also because I've been involved for, like, nine years. Yes. I was yeah. just going to yeah. say. Nine years, that's pretty good. <laughs> yes. That's pretty good. Yeah. So that's. She will make you your career. And, and really, those are the important other things. Those business cards and the, and the name tag are your way of, of representing us when you're out in the community. And we're so grateful to you for doing that. We want you to be as professional as possible. So if you lose your name tag, and for the record, I have lost my magnetic PPACG <laughs> name tag on a recent occasion, which is an expensive one to reproduce. So I have also made myself one just like you so that I have it in my car if I can't ever find That's my other one. That's where mine is, is in my car. That's what so those me. business cards and name tags are replaceable, and I am very happy to do that for you because those are your way of being the public face of this organization, and I want to make that as easy for you as possible. So we're now, we're part of the RAC pack. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's, that's rat, not rat. Yes. Yes. And I started out good. I have this on. Yes. It's usually good. out in my car. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Uh, now we're moving on to calendar of events number seven. And uh, there's an annual provider fair, which is. So a month from this meeting, instead of a conventional meeting, we will have the provider fair, and this room will be set up completely differently. And we will have all of our providers. I'm looking at you, Bobby. Yes. So they will all be here and eager to talk to RAC members and each other about the services that they provide using um, funding through the AAA. That also means we'll have a very brief business meeting up front. We'll probably circle the chairs as we did last year in the center of the room, sit down, have a brief business meeting so that we can actually take minutes, and then move on to the fair for the rest of the morning. 
cool. And the, um, I'm sorry, was there a question? No, I was just saying very cool. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> And then the Ent Retirement Series, for those of you who are returning RAC members, you may remember that last year the AAA partnered with Ent Federal Credit Union um, and provided in Ent facilities, and I think it was only one building, but it was an Ent housed um, education series about what to do as an older adult. It really had a retirement orientation, but we sent staff to lead either two or three of the series of six programs. They were essentially, there were evening long presentations that included, you know, the presentation up front and then followed with um, questions and answers and distribution of information. That is being worked on again and we're hoping to start those sometime in the spring to early summer, and we are also hoping to host one or more of them here this time. So as we get closer, I'll have more details for you. All right, thank you. That's a good opportunity for any of us that have that time to sit in or at least walk through and say, hey, thank you, and for working with AAA on doing this to get information out to sure. the community. Yes. Really mm -hmm. important opportunity, I think. Provider Fair all. is February the 23rd at 9 a.m.? Yes, right. it is the next. <laughs> Next rec meeting. Okay. It really is no more going to attend as, yeah. a first, as a first new person. It, it's a little overwhelming, I think, because it there's is. so many incredible things that our providers do. But it's a, like a great dip into the pool since a lot of it will be new information. Right. All that list of providers that you have in the purple folder, virtually all of those providers will be here at the next meeting. We only had one that wasn't able to make it last year. So. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, it's virtually all. Okay, so then we're on to community information. Anybody have anything else they'd like to bring up at this point? I just wanted to mention about the Alzheimer's Association real quickly. Um, I also serve Elbert County through my office here in the Springs, but our organization is a statewide organization, so just as an FYI. Okay, thank you, Barb. Well, national, right? We, we are national. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah we, we are. Okay, the next uh, let's see, annual provider fair, you mentioned that already, and the meeting is on February 23rd. And I think we're right about at the end in time for adjournment. But before, I'd just like to throw out one, th one last thought from Dave. It's that um, I can tend to monopolize conversations. I tend to uh, high energy. I don't have ADHD, but uh, <laughs> I came from Minnesota. I grew up there, so you speak fast uh, because it's cold all the time. Uh, but I think the important thing is what I really want to uh, point out here or, or urge is that everybody take the opportunity to engage and bring in thoughts and ideas and react to things that are said. If we, if you think as an organization we need to be doing different things, bring on the ideas. That's really an important piece. And I'm going to count on Margaret as the chair and our vice chair and uh, Marilyn to work with me on that so that they can also be, we can use them instead of people just sitting and receiving information. It's like this is an opportunity to share. I think that's a really important thing. Last thing will be, I don't care who gets credit. I had 20 years in the Navy, I did uh, 20 plus years doing defense contracting, it's the same thing, good ideas are great, but it's not an ownership thing with me. I really don't care, so I don't want to own these things, I want to be a strong supporter for all of the ideas and the initiatives we have, but it's not an ownership thing here. So I really encourage ideas and energy and, and actions from the members. And with that, Nancy, sorry about <laughs> Just before you close. Um, what about the new federal administration and its effect on us? I think we all know it's to be determined. We just don't know. We safe. don't know. I mean, all those, all those uh, what, uh, 200 bills. plus bills that are introduced in, uh, at, in Denver. That's, that's just What's Colorado. The yeah. What's the impact on all the agencies? No idea. So mm -hmm. we'll just stand by. I think I th it's, we're in new uncharted territory, I think, as I th far as... Yeah. Uh, how things are going to roll up. We'll just have to wait and see and be adaptive and flexible and hopefully we can overcome things that uh, may come our way that make it more difficult to operate. I think one thing that it, one thing is certain, which is that any changes that are enacted regarding the Older Americans Act in Washington will take a little while to trickle down to Colorado. Colorado already has its allocation of funds from, through the Older Americans Act for this fiscal year. Okay. And the federal fiscal year operates one quarter later 
than the state fiscal year and one quarter earlier than a traditional year. So a regular fiscal year ends December 31st, just as the calendar year does. The state fiscal year ends June 30th, so it's off by six months. And just to be difficult, the federal fiscal year ends September 30th. So the funds that Colorado currently has from the federal government were awarded effective October 1, 2016. So we're good all the way through September 30th of 2017, and in all likelihood, the huge ocean liner that is the federal government will not be able to turn quickly enough to have a significant impact on the funds for the following fiscal year. But again, who knows what's going to happen in Washington. Thank you. All right. So. Phyllis had a question. Mm. Oh, no. no. Okay. What is it with you people looking like you're raising your hands? <laughs> <laughs> I was just flipping here first. Uh, we want that. But at this point, let's, let's Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> just as a sidebar, after this is not on the We didn't have a This is a tech conversation. I think the table talk. And if we could adjourn at a little bit earlier time each, each meeting, then there would be opportunity to say, well, let's talk about that. What about this idea over here? Don't put it there. That's the type of thing to really energize you know, us so we're better spokespersons, advocates, or seniors in our own areas. Research. Thank yes, you. I Great meeting. Soft research. I mean, you know, I have a master's. So I have. For the ballot. No way. We're in the middle. <laughs> she wants to talk now. <laughs> I'm not accustomed for you to be up here. I'm glad you're supposed to be back here. I'm not going home right now. Hey, I'm getting my ears. But I can't. That's okay. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. you, you get some. Let's like exchange this. info here. Let's get the info. I'll put because it in my card. I'll call him and tell him. Nominate. I don't know. When you nominate okay. chair and stuff like that, I've been gone for two months. Right. You know, and, and so there's a two, two, two year limit. Two years left. Two years. I don't know that yeah. I will. Mm -hmm. now, I still it's a two license. year uh, sentence, if you will. But I choose not to. <laughs> oh, vice chair. Oh, or vice chair. Yeah. Okay. It's a two year sentence. Oh, okay. And this is, okay, Nancy. We're a month from now. All right. Oh, to have your day. Day. <laughs> so when you when, when you guys for coming, how do you oh, this, is, this is just thank you. This is just outstanding it is. to have to have you here. Oh, I it's just outstanding. <laughs> oh, it's, it makes a difference. Yeah, we hope so. You make a difference by your sheer presence. <laughs> I don't think this belongs to anybody. Yeah. Else. No. She has she's here. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. She's she's a great. She's a great. She's been here. Yeah, I can box this at the beginning of the year. Like, no, oh, Ruth. Oh, that's why everybody loves her. It's just like I've been out. Well, well you know what? Yes. I've been doing. I've been doing. Oh, well, you don't know she's there. Do you know when the new one's coming out? Oh, my gosh. And she's teaching. And then I was always happy. A couple of joints, a couple of years off. Yeah, yeah. 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 I had to adjust because I know that my son was up and I, I used to say I do gerontology, right. yeah. but now so I are one. I are okay. one. Uh, Where did you teach? Uh, uh, Bethel College of Nursing. No wonder I know. wasn't able to make it. I worked at UCCS um, for many, many years. Oh, did you? Not in the 80s. Like I say, I don't know. No, no, no. Well, we didn't join. We didn't join UCCS. Yes. Okay. Yeah, with Sarah, right? Sarah Falls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But your name is. Of course. I know you for that. Yeah, I worked in the marketing publications department. Kind of. The discussion for prior to a number of years. But I've been retired from there for a while. Yeah. Okay. And there's a lot of that. <laughs> a while. <laughs> Ten years now, I can't believe it. We'll never know. Well, I mean, she's a talented volunteer. I'm a volunteer rep. So, thank you for coming. Oh, wow. Well, you look great.